So today we're going to be talking about the wisdom of Solomon, and the tools of government, and how they were the same back then that they are today. And in order to do that, I'm going to first give some background on who Solomon was. And I'll be reading, this is from the New Jerusalem Bible, 2 Samuel 11, verses 2 to 5. And this, is, uh, this starts off with Solomon's parents. It happened towards evening when David had got word from resting and was strolling on the palace roof that from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David made inquiries about this woman and was told, Why, that is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and wife of Uriah the Hittite. David then sent messengers to fetch her. She came to him, and he lay with her just after she had purified herself from her period. Then she, went, she then went home again. The woman conceived and sent word to David, I am pregnant. Now, David, of course, was the king, and often not really remembered so much as a king, but remembered as a man after God's own heart. But he lust after a married woman, and because he was king, he was apparently used his uh, political office to do whatever he wanted. Which happens even with even with good people in office sometimes. Even with good people with strong integrity. But because she got pregnant, David sends for her husband, who is later listed in Samuel as one of David's champions. So Uriah the Hittite comes back, and David says, Well, why don't you go spend some time with your wife? So that way that to be close enough together they won't really know who conceived and David's shame can go unnoticed. But Uriah the Hittite had other plans because this guy was what you call this he was like something out of the John Wayne movie. He was the real deal. You know, he believed that he had a responsibility to the men that were under him because he was one of David's commanders. And he didn't want to be fooling around with his wife while men that were under him could be out there dying. So you know, after this going around, Uriah refuses to do anything. And so David says, well, okay, send you back out into combat. But David doesn't just send him into the combat. David sends him to where the combat is the fiercest to make sure that Uriah dies. Or, yeah. And then moving on, so David then marries up Bathsheba as one of his other wives. And, you know, hopefully the timing's not so far off that people will think that you know, that, that, that he was going to have a, a bastard child, but regardless, I mean, I, I don't know how you think a cover-up like that could work because people just aren't that dumb, but nevertheless, you know, when you're in a high political office, I guess you have this intent to make it look good and make it look like your integrity is maintained no matter what. But, now... I said people weren't dumb, and one of the prophets was Nathan, who then comes to David and, and, you know, gives him the story, an allegory of what happened, what David did, and David becomes mad, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's like the light bulb clicks in his head, oh, and it's, you know, it's, you got this moment where it's like, oh crap, Nathan's talking about me, and Nathan also tells him that the child that he conceived is going to die, and then we're going to skip ahead to 2 Samuel verses 12 to 16, or Samuel 12, 16 to 18, rather. It says, David pleaded with Yahweh for the child. He kept a strict fast and went home and spent the night lying on the ground, covered with sacking. The officials of his household stood round him, intending to get him off the ground, but he refused, nor would he take food from him. On the seventh day, the child died. David's retinue were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. Even when the child was alive, he thought, we reasoned with him and he would not listen to us. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He will do something desperate. Now, uh, the child dies and David has a strange response. And everybody there marks about how it's a strange response because David just picks up and goes back to work. Goes back to doing what, you know, like nothing had ever happened. And everybody thought that this was strange. But then out of grief, David has a, uh, another son with, Sol with Bathsheba. And that son is Solomon. And Solomon is 
Well, depending on how you look at it, it was heralded to be, you know, the wisest man on earth when he comes to his reign as king. But we need to talk about that and figure out what made him so wise or whether or not it was just, you know, political marketing like we have today where we're told that, you know, Obama is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, yet he's constantly drone striking countries all over the world, blowing up men, women, and children. But he's a Peace Prize winner, so it's peaceful. And so we have this idea of, is Solomon, is there wisdom to Solomon, or is it just marketing? Is it just, if we keep repeating it long enough, people actually will think that he's wise. So, we're going to skip ahead to 1 Kings, chapter 2, verse 15. And this was, this was before Solomon was actually, well, anointed king. And his brother Adonijah, who was actually the rightful succession to become king, but I'm sure there's a lot of backroom politics going on to where David actually named Solomon king. But this is Adonijah talking to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. He said, you know, he said, that the kingdom should have come to me and that all of Israel expected me to be king. Now, all of Israel expected him to be king. But the crown eluded me and fell to my brother since it came to him from Yahweh. And I, I, you know, I mean, it seems rather odd that Israel wants a king, but then they don't follow the rightful rules of succession like other kings would in other kingdoms. And so here's some of the things that when Solomon first becomes king, here's some of the things that happens. Abiathar was stripped of the priesthood, and Joab fled to the temple and was holding on to the altar, but he was killed anyway. These were political dissidents. These were people that were supporting his brother to be king. And so we're going to move on to 1 Kings 1, 49-51. At this, Adjanah's guest taking flight got up and made several directions. Adonijah, in terror of Solomon, got up and ran to cling to the horns of the altar. Solomon was told you should know that Adonijah is terrified of King Solomon and is now clinging to the horns of the altar saying, Let King Solomon first swear to me that he will not have his servant executed. Now, he's had political dissidents stripped of their positions. He said some of them killed. And these are just the ones that are mentioned. There's probably more. There's probably all the servants of the household. There's probably all types of people being banished and being thrown out that were supporting Adonijah. But keep in mind, Adonijah is Solomon's brother, and he's scared to death that Solomon is going to kill him. Now, this doesn't sound like the benevolent monarch that his father David was. But Adonijah obviously let go, because I don't know if it's so much that Solomon took pity on him, or that there was no soldiers that would actually kill him on the altar. And so Solomon... And one of the first things he does is he marries Pharaoh's daughter against Israel's laws. And we're told that a lot of times, we're taught as Christians that Solomon was a good king up until the end of his kingdom. But if you look, it already starts off in a very tumultuous fashion. He's having political dissidents quiet. He's marrying foreigners, which was a big thing because... It's a repeating pattern throughout history that when foreign interests come into the kingdom, everything gets screwed up. The prosperity and everything leaves. But we're going to talk about the the story of Solomon. He has this dream, and this is this is supposedly where where everybody realizes how wise he is. And this comes from First Kings chapter three, verses five to fourteen. At Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a, dream, in a dream during the night. God said, Ask what you would like me to give you. Solomon replied, You show most faithful love to your servant David, my father. When he, lived his, when he lived his life before you in faithfulness and the brightness and integrity of the heart, you have continued this most faithful love to him by allowing a son of his to sit on his throne today. Now Yahweh... My, Yahweh, my God, you have made your servant king in succession to David, my father. But I am a very young man, unskilled in leadership, 
And here is your servant surrounded with people whom you have chosen, a people so numerous that its number cannot be counted or reckoned. So give your servant a heart to understand how to govern your people, how to discern between good and evil, for how could one otherwise govern such a people as yours? It pleased Yahweh that Solomon should have asked this, since you have asked for this, God said, and not asked for long life for yourself or riches or the lives of your enemies, but have asked for discerning judgment for yourself. Here and now I do what you ask. I give you a heart wise and shrewd as no one has done before and no one will have after you. What you have not asked for I shall give you too. Such riches and glory as no other king can match. And I shall give you a long life if you follow my ways, keeping my laws and commandments, your father David, your father as your father David followed them. Now right here, this is where there's this big red flag because if you'll notice it says Solomon had a dream during the night. And so we know that this story can only come from Solomon himself. Because nobody else can know what you dream when you sleep. And so, nobody else interprets this dream either, which is very odd. Because usually dreams in the Bible are interpreted from someone else. And it's usually because they're mysterious and nobody knows. But this dream is extremely straightforward. Straight forward. It's not, it's not something that, you know, it would take years of psychoanalysis to understand or anything that modern, you know, th this is something that, that, that Freud wouldn't bat an eye at to interpret it. Nobody would, because it's straightforward. And so, this is, this is apparently something that's written down and recorded in, in the Bible, which means it's recorded in their holy scripture, which means it's something that they want people to understand and read. This is for a reason and is this media marketing you know is this what it was like because they didn't have television or radio back then or the internet so is this what they would do they would write these things down so that other people could read about them it's like oh my gosh we have such a humble king that asked for wisdom and God was pleased with that and gave him wisdom is, is that what's going on it, it it has all it has to me that that whole just feel good line of, of a state of the union address you know like the one president obama just gave not too long ago talking about how we're all great and we're all so good and everything but there's no substance to it there's absolutely no substance to this dream whatsoever and i i have a real problem with that but let's move on Let's see the wisdom of Solomon in practice. 1 Kings 3, 16 to 28. Now, this is a, a story about two women that come before Solomon. And it says, If it please you, my lord, one of these women said, This woman and I live in the same house. And while she was in the house, I gave birth to a child. Now it happened on the third day after my delivery that this woman also gave birth to a child. We were alone together. There was no one else in the house with us, just the two of us. Now one night this woman's son died. She overlaid him, and in the middle of the night she got up and took my son from beside me while your servant was asleep. She took him in arms and put her own dead son in mine. She took him in her arms and put her own dead son in mine. When I got up to the suckle my child, there he was dead, but in the morning I looked at him carefully, and he was not the child I had born at all. But the other woman spoke, that is not true, my son is a live one, yours is a dead one. And the first retorted, that is not true, your son is a dead one, mine is a live one. And so they wrangled before the king. This one says, the king observed, my son is the one who is alive, your son is dead. While the others say, that is not true, your son is a dead one, mine is live. Bring me a sword, said the king, and a sword was brought into the king's presence. Cut the living child in two, the king said and give one half to one and half to the other. At this, the woman who was the mother of the living child said, Let them give her the live child. On no account let them kill him. But the other said, He shall belong to neither of us. Cut him in half. Then the king gave his decision. Give the child to the first woman, he said, and do not kill. She is his mother. All of Israel came to hear the judgment which the king had pronounced and held the king in awe, recognizing that he possessed divine wisdom of dispersing justice. 
divine wisdom of dispersing justice, threatening to cut an infant in two. Divine wisdom or psychosis for dispensing justice is my question. Um, I had this discussion with someone recently and they asked me, well, you don't think he would have really done it? Well, we know that his own brother was terrified for his life of him, that he had other political dissidents killed or banished or, or stripped of their titles or whatever. We know that, that you know, from the, the scriptures before, we know that he's capable of cruelty, of instilling fear in people, and that's what this is. This is a threat meant to intimidate and start fear. This is, and we call this wisdom, but this is how the government always operates. It's always threats and intimidation and fear. And then they get you to react in a way that they tell you is beneficial to you. That it works better for everybody if you react that way. And this is, this is like the, the CPS guidelines for everything. It's like we take children, we threaten people with not giving their children back, and then they do what they want. The king wants them to stop arguing, so he threatens the child, and people do what they want. And he disregards it. Now, people are always like, well, well he just needed to get the answer. I don't think you need to threaten people to get that answer. There's other creative ways to do that. All you have to do is say, whichever woman is willing to give up the child can come live in my palace for the rest of their life and never want for anything. I mean, I, I think that has just as much chance of working as threatening to cut a, a, a living infant in half. I don't think it's wisdom. I think it's just fear and intimidation used to control people, which is how the government's operated apparently for thousands of years. But let's let's move on and talk about some of the other wisdom of Solomon. And I don't want to go through all of First Kings, but basically it talks about Solomon living this rock star lifestyle and having all these foreign dignitaries and queens and monarchs and people all come visit him and try to outsmart him so he can act you know, highly intelligent and whatnot. But let's talk about the wisdom of Solomon and what he allowed to happen to Israel. Let's skip ahead to 1 Kings 5, verse 20 first. So now, have th uh, so now have cedars of Lebanon cut down for me. My servants will work with your servants, and I shall pay for the hire of your servants at whatever rate you fix. As you know, we have no one skilled in felling trees as the Sidonians. Now, look at this right here. He's going to pay foreigners whatever they want keep keep that in mind he's going to pay these foreigners to bring in trees to build the temple whatever they want now we're going to move on to verses 27 to 32 king Solomon raised a levy throughout israel for forced labor the levy numbered 30,000 men he sent these to lebanon in relays 10,000 a month they spent one month in lebanon and two months at home adoram was in charge of forced labor Solomon also had 70,000 porters and 80,000 quarrymen in the mountains, as well as administrators, officials who supervised the work, 3,300 of them and, one, and of men employed in the work. At the king's order, they quarried hewn stones, special stones for laying of the, founda the temple foundation's dress stones. Solomon's workmen and Hiram's workmen and the Gibbalites cut and assembled the wooden stone for the building of the temple. Now notice this. He's coming in here, and he's, we're talking about the whole idea of letting foreign interest in, and this is exactly what he does. He comes in here, he pays foreigners whatever they want for their goods and services, but the Israelites, his countrymen, you're, you're now into forced labor camps. You now have to spend one out of every three months out cutting trees or quarrying stones. And forced labor it's been levied against you you have to pay for that but the foreigner next to you that's doing the same thing or that's probably got a whip over your back we're going to pay him handsomely I'm gonna read on here Solomon was last in succession to be king oh so actually this that's not a verse that's my notes here. Now, keep in mind, Solomon was actually last in, in line to be king. 
He was the youngest of David's sons. And some of the things that we've went over that I want to keep you, keep the people should keep in mind is that his birth came at the stress of two parents that lost a child. Two parents whose relationship was a point of shame for David. So what type of uh, what, what type of upbringing do you think Solomon is going to have when he's a point of shame for his parents and he was conceived out of grief for another son that was the point of that shame? It was just a continuation of that. I mean, was he wise or was he a tyrant? He had political opponents banished from priesthood, killed. His own brother was terrified of him for his life. He's levying forced labor in Israel to build a temple that his father David didn't feel he was fit to build because of all the bloodshed that he caused. Some of the other things that Solomon does, he appoints tribal leaders in Israel. He splits Israel into 12 factions, which later become known as the 12 tribes of Israel. And consider the accounts of Solomon outside the Bible as well. There, there's other accounts that come from other countries other than Israel, which this pursuit of knowledge is expressed in the ways of he was heavily involved in witchcraft and the occult and demonology and black magic and all these other things. And while that stuff might not be in the Bible, why would it be? Why would he want it in there? It just seemed to fit with this mindset of being hell-bent, of being more revered all over the entire world, which is one of the things that slips in in his dreams. He says, I'm going to make you revered, not from Israel, but from all the monarchs and all the other countries all over the world. And that right there is kind of your clue that the one thing that he didn't realize that he put in the dream when he invents this, what I believe is a scheme for marketing. But we're going to, we're going to read on here because... I think there, there's one other thing here that comes out of First Kings chapter 11, verses 29, 33, and 40. And I just wrote this up because I want to try and uh, save time on this. One day when Jeroboam had gone out to Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah of Shiloh accosted him on the road. Ahijah was wearing a new cloak. The two of them were in open country by themselves. Now Jeroboam was, was a manager of forced laborers and, and in one of the northern tribal regions. And Ahijah was called a prophet of Yahweh, even in, in First Kings here. And the next verse, verse 33, for he was forsaken me to worship, for he has forsaken me, and he's talking about Solomon, to worship Astarte, the goddess of the Sidonians, Kamosh, the god of Moab, Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, Ammonites, he has not followed my ways by doing what I regard as right or by keeping my laws and ordinances as his father David did. Now, people say that this is where they get the idea that it's towards the end of Solomon's reign that all this is going on. I just, I don't believe that because it's talking about this is the, a revolt that's building. A revolt doesn't just happen like that overnight. It takes time. It takes lots of time for people to just keep continually getting pushed and pushed around until eventually they get fed up, and this is what's going on. And it says Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam. This was after they formed a revolt, but he made off and fled to Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and he remained in Egypt until Solomon's death. Now keep this in mind that, that, that people all over the country we're being forced to worship foreign gods. It's not like, oh, we're just freedom of religion. We're going to respect these people and move in and let them worship how they want. No, they're being forced to worship this way against, against their own will. And this leads to hundreds of years of Israel being under foreign control through, through religion. It's religion as a weapon because once these other religions seep in, they get in there and Israel can't even worship around him. So, before Solomon died, he, he calls the rebel. And, you know, it's a question that you should ask yourself when, when people talk about the wisdom of Solomon. 
Was this something that happened over time? Was it slowly pressure building? Or was it just all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we can't stand for this. Hayes lost his mind all of a sudden. Uh, I, I don't think that's it. And we should also consider how later on in history, some of the other prophets and even Jesus seem to have a little bit of a derogatory mindset about Solomon. And we should really look at Isaiah chapter 37, 24 to 25. It says, Through your minions you have insulted the Lord, thinking with my chariots I have climbed the mountaintops, the utmost peaks of Lebanon. I have felled its mighty cedars, its finest cypresses, have reached its furthest peak, its forest garden. Yes, I have dug and drunk of pouring waters under the soles of my feet. I have dried up Egypt's rivers. This is what Solomon was doing, and this is what Isaiah is saying, that his, it was an insult to God. Isaiah, through allegory, is saying that what Solomon did was insulting to God. Not at the end of his reign, pretty much through the body of his reign. Let's look at what Jesus says about Solomon and his rock star lifestyle in Matthew 6, 28 and 29. And why worry about clothing? Think of the flowers growing in the fields. They never have to work or spin. Yet I assure you that not even Solomon in all his royal robes was clothed like one of these. And it's not directly derogatory, but it does seem to be a little bit derogatory towards Solomon, saying that he put so much effort into making himself look great, and he can't even compare to a flower in a field. And what we have to realize is, is that the wisdom of Solomon is the wisdom of government throughout the ages. It's the same tools remarketed and remarketed again where the government uses violence and threats of violence to coerce behavior out of people and then insult you by telling you it is wise, by telling you that it is good government, by telling you that a Nobel Peace Prize winner can blow up whoever he wants and it's peaceful, by telling you that guns are dangerous and no one should have them while they surround themselves with small armies, while telling you that they won't tax you but they create new taxes and still tax you and tell you that you're not being taxed. Or more recently, like Christopher Dorner, where they play audio where the police are shouting that they're going to burn the cabin that he's in down, and then later they tell you that they did not burn the cabin down. The tools of government are always the same, and it, it's always fear and threats, intimidation, using fear to coerce behavior because you think it will get better if you heal. It has always been this way. We have the blueprint that this is how Solomon worked. He made threats and intimidation and then people yielded for fear of it actually coming true. And so government hasn't changed. They tell you stories, just like Solomon's dream, and then they stamp a confidential stamp on it and say, oh, you can't question it. It's confidential. It's a state's secret. It could, co it could cost people lives. So nothing has changed in thousands of years with government. Their tools are always the same. They remarket them and make you think that it's something new, when in reality it's not. And that's the anarchist transmission. We should start questioning everything. Question scripture. Question your pastors and your clergy about what they're teaching. Because I just don't think that a lot of the common, common thoughts on Solomon and his wisdom are true. I think there's enough evidence there to say that he was a tyrant. That he was didn't give a damn about anyone in Israel, including his own family. 
that he was hell bent on, you know, being thought of as the greatest king of all times, and it's just we we our leaders are the same today. We haven't changed. We're just like those people in Israel. We're submitting, thinking that things are going to get better, and it's not getting better. We need to start taking back and reading the scriptures for ourselves instead of being told by others what to think of it. There's plenty in there that's applicable and practical to everything that happens in the world today. Signing off.